Auckland, even when I'm well stoned on a tab of LSD or an Indian grass, you still look to me like an elephant's arsehole, surrounded with blue-black hemorrhoids. The sound of the opening and shutting of bank books, the thudding of refrigerator doors, the ripsaw voices of Glen Eden mothers yelling at their children, the chugging noise of masturbation from the bedrooms of the bourgeois, the voices of dead teachers droning in dead classrooms, the TV voice of Mr. Muldoon, the farting noise of the trucks that grind their way down Queen Street, has drowned forever the song of Tangara on a thousand beaches, the sound of the wind among the green volcanoes, and the whisper of the human heart. If I were king of Sweden, I would never wear a crown, but I'd ride in a golden carriage with the window down. I would wake up very early in my place by the sea. I would breakfast on marshmallow and have the same for tea. I see you conquer age as the prow of a canoe beats down the plumes of Tangaroa. You, straight-backed, a girl, your dark hair on your shoulders lifting up our grandchild. How you put them to shame, all the flouncing girls. Your face wears the marks of age as a warrior his moko. Double the beauty. A soul like the great albatross who only nests in mid-ocean under the eye of Terra. You have broken the back of age. I tremble to see it. Salt in the wound, a bitter wind from the south. No shelter, no balm, only the ice caves of truth and loneliness, that old traveling companion for company always now. How goes it with you? I had land down for sleep, man, when he called me to go across the wet paddock and burgle the dark church. You see, Colin, the nuns bolt the side door, and I unbolt it like a timid thief. Red light, moonlight mixed together. Steps from nowhere thud in the porch. A bee wakes up and buzzes. The whole empty par and the Maori dead are present. There I lie down cruciform on the cold linoleum, a violator of God's decorum. We walked up Queen Street, came to a bank building with the big sort of fluted columns in the front and the like, and as we came to there, he sort of pulled me aside and, uh, and we stood in the sort of entrance way and he read me, uh, I think it was Ode to Auckland, and that was fine, and as we walked away, I said to him, I thought when you left you said, no more books, no more poems. And he just looked at me and said, Colin, I can't help it, he said. They just crawl up my back. Dear Sam, if you are 22, why should I foist my gall on you? The answer is that poets live by a refusal to forgive the mighty bog of social shit that has no use for sex or wit or art or hope, but simply is internally its own abyss. At 22 or 41, you need your gumboots and a gun. There are certain poets that have written the magic, I don't know why it should be, but 30 all-time poems that will survive all things and everything. The people I have on this list would be W.B. Yeats, Bob Dylan, James K. Baxter, Pablo Neruda. To other great, great... It's, in other words, you do everything else, and everything else gets forgotten. But there are those poems that survive any language change, any nuclear war, um, anything, they'll always be there. They can admire the empty lion skin, the heart skewered by print who will admire. But from you, Noel, I wish more. The friend's stance, confessor for my sin, which is pride alone. Yet pride alone will win niche of immortal marble, despised and hungered for. I knew it was a major, major talent, and I was out in the depths straight away, as though I'd met young Shakespeare or someone like that. How do you handle this? I mean, uh, 
we all maybe at times try to write poetry and we um, nudge one another along, but he was somebody of a different order, a different order of being. And it gave me a tremendous, um, uh, Philip, as it were, to be dealing with that. The beginnings are tied up in a bundle somewhere near the beginning of the track itself. Like the dead cat in a bag, floating and tugged at by eels on the surface of the black bottomless river hole, 200 yards from the house where I lived till I was eight. Before the hydrogen bomb had been invented to teach fishes and birds to behave, I lived in a town by the sea. It was called Brighton. The town stood plain huge at the world's center, its gravel roads shining like snow, its lupin jungles unexplored except by me and several cousins, its blue gums tall as mountains, its houses bigger than barns, and above it higher than any mountain in the whale-backed island, Saddle Hill, ready at the drop of a hat to erupt like Stromboli and blow the known world to atoms. Here my brother laid lines for the basking eels, brutes thicker than a forearm, sailed his flaxstick navy, twig mastered on rough ripples, flogged by desire's crosswind. Nothing made us afraid. Me being me, I'd have to sail model boat, you see. And I used to uh, get a day when there was a good breeze, and the idea was to get him on the other side, and he'd have to turn around and turn back again, that sort of thing, you see. So he'd do this for a while, but I was keen, I could do this all afternoon. Then he, after a while he got, he got fed up, he got sick of it, he'd get, take off and way home, and I'd go crook about it. Didn't like it, didn't like it at all. No, not fear of drowning, drawn down in weedy arms, nor any ghost dragging the eyes unwilling to gaze on Adam's wound. Yet once, in a safe bed, sweating, chilled by nightmare, I saw a pyre kindled on the river mound, and stark there, her face in anguish, smiling, ablaze and unconsumed, my loved grandmother, dead. A river full of eels and boats and swimming cows flowed past the town's edge, long, deep and dangerous, a smaller Amazon. One could sit on the weed-green slippery piles below the bridge all through a summer afternoon, while trucks and buses rumbled overhead, catching cockabullies finned with fire on a line of black cotton and hooks baited with sausage meat that were five a penny at Murdoch's store. The house I lived in then had three stories, one for birds, one for people, and one for cats. Birds told stories all day in the space between the ceiling and the hot corrugated iron roof. Cats yelled and wrestled and held midnight concerts in the dry, smelly dark under the floor. My mother had a Newnham MA degree in Old French and my father was a self-educated Otago farmer who recited Burns and Shelley and Byron and Blake and Tom Hood and Henry Lawson when the mood took him. Somewhere back in the Freudian fog belt, these two strong influences began to work on me. He didn't start writing, actual writing, until he was about seven, I think. Then he started writing. And he wrote then continuously until he died, without stopping, almost. <laughs> I have seen inwardly my first ancestors in this country, those Gaelic-speaking men and women, descending with their bullock drays and baggage to cross the mouth of what is now the Brighton River, near to sunset, when the black and red of the sky intimated a new thing, a radical loss and a radical beginning. And the earth lay before them for that one moment of history as a primitive and sacred bride, unentered and unexploited. Those people whose bones are in our cemeteries are the only tribe I know of. And though they were scattered and lost, their unfulfilled intention of charity, peace, and a survival that is more than self-preservation burns like radium in the cells of my body. Objector in France in the First World War. He said to him, we'll make your life a hell, Baxter, if you don't obey. 
and they did. When I was only seaman in a gland, or less than that, my father hung from a torture post at Mud Farm because he would not kill. The guards fried sausages, and as the snow came darkly, I feared a death by cold in the cold groin and plotted revolution. His black and swollen thumbs explained the brotherhood of man. They were tied to a single upright by the ankles, the knees, and the wrists. And the wrists were tied behind the uh, pole and then pulled up, high up. And, <clears throat> well, it was extremely painful, uh, painful beyond measure, that he thought he couldn't bear it. And then finally, he could. Objectively, I remember my childhood as a happy time. Yet a sense of grief has attached itself to my early life, like a tapeworm in the stomach of a polar bear. A sense of grief, even at times a sense of grievance, helped me write poems. In a way, the poems sprang out of a quarrel with the status quo. The first poem I wrote was no doubt significant, at least in the way I approached the writing of it. I climbed up to a hole in a bank in a hill above the sea. I found a burrow, a kind of seat in the rock, at the top of a steep slope of grass above a cliff, and crouched down there. I didn't realize it was the Delphic cave. But in this solitude, the sound of the breakers on the rocks below had a hypnotic effect. And for the first time, I heard that voice inside my head. Not in the head, the mind that makes my poems for me. O ocean, in thy rocky bed, the starry fishes swim about. There coral rocks are strewn around, like some great temple on the ground. I was then seven years old. When I was nine, the family shifted to England for a year or two, and I attended a Quaker boarding school in the Cotswolds. London claimed me. She was heavy and huge. Her barges and her dank wharves flecked with soot, placarded tubes and fog at Christmas, mute paling and palace. The Cotswolds were a refuge. Leaf mould, stone, thatched roofs, blackberry hedge, Lanes, willows, snow slush, bells, homesickness, running the gauntlet. I wrote poems, scrapped poems half begun on clouds and comets, a tower seen from the street, skeletons found there, bats, snake at my feet, the castle, Terry's arm broken, when set he sweated with pain. I came back to New Zealand at 13 in the first flush of puberty, quite out of touch with my childhood companions and uncertain whether I was an Englishman or a New Zealander. For I fell into the habit of poem writing with a vengeance and counted it a poor week when I had not written four or five pieces of verse. Like most New Zealanders, I remember adolescence as a very arid time. A time when sex and intellect are both active, but have nothing to feed on but the sight of a girl's legs in the bus and coloured diagrams of test tubes in a science notebook. Like certain animals in cages, the adolescent begins to devour himself. The slow language of the waves gave hope of truth to come. Wideness. A dark meeting with a woman with a body like the moon. The months of water speaking, putting aside the barren peace of those who are naked only in their graves. I attended King's High School in Dunedin. I think I would have liked it better if it had been co-educational. My unwillingness to learn never deserted me. But by now, the dinosaur's egg was hatching. Some of the verse I wrote privately every day of the week had control and shape and meaning. There are some things that still stick in my mind, not dates or verbs, but moods and colours. The feet shuffling, the different smells from the skins of different boys, the afternoon light coming in the windows, the clock crawling around, and the high voices singing. At the time, it was something to get over quickly, but now it makes me feel sad. 
those adolescent voices, the boys all waiting to grow up, thinking all the best times were still coming to them, and not knowing that in spite of all the guilt and uncertainty, they had something right then that they would never have again. friends were and who they weren't and so forth and it was pretty hard on the person like myself because I had uh, friends that used to go out in the boat and that sort of thing and then the, then this then this world came along and I went my way and, and they went theirs. There was a great difference between my own socialist pacifist family move towards war. I remember how in my teens we could not put the light on in the upper room at night because such neighbours would imagine we were signalling to Japanese submarines. Many chaps told me that if I was going the way I was going to be, I'd have to watch out. For instance, my foreman, he told me, you're going to be shot. He's, he's quite worried about me. You're going to, you'll be shot if you, if you go the way you're going. This will be the finish of you. And I remember the time when a crowd of boys of my own age surrounded me in a shelter shed at school, shouting abuse and inflicting a certain amount of physical violence. These experiences were, in the long run, very valuable, for they taught me to distrust mass opinion and sort out my own ideas. But at the time, they were distinctly painful. I could compare them, perhaps, with the experiences of a Jewish boy growing up in an anti-Semitic neighborhood. They created a gap in which the poems were able to grow. They put my brother behind barbed wire to be eaten alive for five years by the devil of boredom, weeding flax in a bog at Shannon. Ron Howe, he was a leading member of the Pacifist Society. He gave me a copy of We Will Not Cease. I read it all night, and it was the most a moving, wonderful story. So when I got into camp, I heard that one of his sons was there, and that drew me to him immediately. And we shared a hut, and um, I was interested in writing poetry, and, and one day he said his brother writes poetry, and he told me about his brother. And uh, so he wrote to him, and the brother said he'd like to see some my writing and uh, from then we started to exchange letters and the huge difference between Jim and Terence was quite a shock in a way. Terence was like the rest of us, an ordinary man about the place with a, a bit of an aversion to anything of the art cart and, and intellectualism, whereas Jim from the beginning was mature and intense and, and very learned. It was a huge shock to be exposed to this young mind. As a child, I was childish, an intuitional ease, had missed the vice of sensitivity, waded the flood race of a century, but felt the capacity for pain increase till each day no longer a wood of peace held larks of Shelley and song, tigers of poetry. Dear Noel, my exams are over. I go to Varsity next year. I'm looking forward to it. I've met some pretty intelligent ones now going. I had a long, unsuccessful love affair with the higher learning, beginning when I timidly entered the registrar's office at Otago University with a head full of bad poems at the age of 17. I liked to look at the birds and trees. My textbooks gathered mold in peace. I regarded swatting as a loathsome disease in the early, early days. Dear Noel, I find Varsity very new, but have become fairly used to things. The best feature is the canteen where I can get coffee before lectures. We can use material culture to trace people's movements, uh, and we can also... The lecturer's head was bald of granite. I admired the flies that skated upon it and watched the clock shift minute by minute in the early, early days. Got a cat 
Good things came to me from Otago. My incipient alcoholism took wings like a bushfire, leaping fence and river in the Bowling Green, the Royal Albert, the Captain Cook, the Grand, the City, the Oban, the Shamrock on Sundays, and the Robert Burns. My best friend had a flat above it. Lying awake on a bench in the town belt, alone, 18, more or less alive, lying awake to the sound of clocks, the railway clock, the town hall clock, and the varsity clock, genteel, exact as a Presbyterian conscience. I heard the hedgehogs chugging around my bench, colder than an ice axe, colder than a bone, sweating the booze out, a spiritual Houdini inside the padlock box of winter, time, and craving. Sometimes I rolled my coat and put it under my head, and when my back got frozen, I put it on again. I thought of my father and mother snoring at home while the fire burned out in feathery embers. I thought of my friends each in their own house, lying under blankets, tidy as dogs or mice. I thought of my med student girlfriend, dreaming of horses, cantering brown-eyed horses in her unreachable bed, wrapped in a yellow quilt. And something bust inside me, like a winter clod cracked open by the frost. A sense of being at the absolute unmoving hub, from which to which the intricate roads went. My girlfriend had a flat of her own, with Japanese teacups and finger bones. In a fortnight, I lost half a stone, in the early, early days. Life went faster in 44. I didn't have time to find it a bore between her place and the bottle store, in the early, early Coat and skirt, a lace frill at her throat, and I chain-smoking. She was a little person with powerful eyes and a very incisive voice, and um, I just adored her, really. The white pebbles on the paths explained the shape of time and death. Outside the high stockade, like a whiplash, the road, dusty and ridged with metal, flowed flickering and level. And Jim shambled with an adolescent sort of gawkiness, and, and the big impression I had as, as we, uh, as they came towards us, there was quite a distance as they approached, the classical approach. Um, and uh, I had this impression of his head being held in front of him like a lantern. Somewhere there's an old medieval picture of someone going with a lantern through the world looking for truth. Would it be Dodge? Somebody like that? Well, that was the image that flashed. The trenches dug around his mouth were what another war had planted there. The old shark eyes of the screw watched for nerves to crack in the conchy zoo. Two kinds of people, screws and men. A friend of mine invited me to go with her to, I think it was a meeting of the literary club. And it just so happened that he, he read at that meeting, you see. And that was the first time I clapped eyes on him, and the first time I heard him read. And it certainly wasn't love at first sight. No, it wasn't. I thought, good grief. What a pity, you know. Well, you can't expect them all to look like poets, can you? <laughs> and that was that. But then a f another friend of mine invited me around to... Uh, Oh, to an, another friend's place. And when I got there, um, the door was opened by this JKB, you see? And I'm not quite sure whether the friends had arranged it or not, but no one else seemed to be around. And so uh, we were sort of, sort of sat silently on a, on a couch like that until the friends arrived. And what struck me was how easy it was, you see. I mean, I wasn't very good at just sitting silently beside a man I'd never met before. And he just sat there, and I just sat there, and, and the friends arrived. And I can't remember, I think, what happened the rest of the evening, and I went home. But sometime soon after, um, he rang me and asked me if I'd like to go out, and I did. Mm -hmm. That's it. poems later on in the less inhibited atmosphere of an iron rolling mill, sweating out the night's beer over a forest of red-hot half-inch rounds. 
some obscure voice at the back of my mind said, you are not meant to be a scholar and a lecturer, Jimmy. You would shrivel up like an old cold potato. You are meant to be someone else, someone else whom you have not yet become. I developed the habit of throwing up a job, drinking for a week or so, writing for a month or so, then taking another job. The best poems I have written were written in this way. In this scarred country, this cold threshold land, the mountains crouch like tigers. By the sea, folk talk of them hid vaguely out of sight, but here they stand in massed solidity to seize up the day and night horizon. Men shut within a whelming bowl of hills grow strange, say little when they leave their high yet buried homesteads. Return there silently when thunder of night rivers fills the sky and giant wings brood over loftily and near. And when I wrote home to my parents and said that this young man had proposed to me, I got a rather sharp reply from my father, you see. And I said, well, uh, well, never mind, you haven't met him yet. However, unbeknownst to me, they wrote to my professor, who had the unpleasant job of, of uh, calling me up and trying to dissuade me from this relationship. And uh, I just went straight out of that interview and I sort of said to Jim, yes. <laughs> Done. <laughs> so, 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 much, so much for parental interference, right? Jim's parents accepted me very well. I don't know that any of them have, had ever met a Māori before. They never, ever made me feel aware of it, you know. I can remember the first time I met Jim's mother and I was terribly, terribly nervous. And it was only when afterwards when I got to know her better, you know, that I realised that she was really very nervous too because most of the interview, which is what it felt like, she sort of fluttered around the sitting room with a feather duster, dabbling here and there, now and again she'd look over her shoulder and say, and uh, what, what do you think of the Russian situation? Well, I mean, I didn't actually have any feelings for the Russian situation. Glover <laughs> and Alan Kernow, and became a member of the Church of England. This was unquestionably a seeding time when I became a man of sorts and ploughed under everything I had ever known as a farmer ploughs in autumn before the hard frosts arrive. At that age of, as I say, about 14, yeah, that was about the time that I started, became, came across poems like, um, oh, one that I loved uh, from the moment, word go was, was Akateo. God, you know, considered traveller this barbarian coast, you who have lost lover or friend. Consider this barbarian coast, traveller, you who have lost lover or friend. It has never made anything out of anything. Drink at these bitter springs. Fishing at river mouth, a woman uses the sea drilled stone her mother used for sinker as big kawai come as tides press upward to time's source. This coast is sheltered to the shearing gangs who burn dead matai in their kitchen. Squire Ark, straight back rider, built an ethos of the leisured life. Lawn, antlered hall and billiard room, glass candelabra brought from Paris. The homestead founded among fields. Unhorsed they sleep. A girl with a necklace of mako teeth they dug from a sand cliff facing south, axe and broken needle. Stay good under slab and cross, thin bones of children burnt by cholera, made tidy by the last stripped nurse. As tributary of a greater stream, your single grief enlarges now the voice of night in Kumara Garden, prayer of the bush pigeon. One drowned at the cattle crossing, one tossed and kicked by a bucking horse who died without confession, wanting no wafer in their teeth. Does the toy toy plume their altar? Are they held safe in the sea's grail? This gully, mounded earth, tunned with silence and the sun's gaze on a choir of breakers has outgrown the pain of love. Early strength of bull-voiced water, when the boom broke and eels clung to the banks, logs plunged and pierced the river hymen. 
Remember iron-coloured skulls of cattle thrown to the crab's crypt, driftwood piled by river flood on the long beach, battered limb and loin where the red-backed spider breeds, by a halcyon sea, the shapes of man, emblems of our short fever. Pluck then from ledges of the sea, crayfish for the sack. Not now, but later, think what you were born for. Drink, child, at the springs of sleep. Yeah, I don't think many things in my life have equal that, finding that poem. And, uh, and when I said to Baxter later on, when I met him, I, I said to him, oh, look, I've got to sort of, you know, say this, but, you know, Akatio is one of my, you know, it's a, just a wonderful poem. And he said, well, Sam, he said, I actually had the flu at the time. I hadn't had a decent shit in days. Uh, and I thought, I don't want to hear this. <laughs>
good sense of fun. He was the one that would get down on the floor and roll around with you and tickle you and play horsey and, yeah. My son was able to build a treehouse with vine ladders. My son in his brown knitted jersey and dungarees makes clowns and animals a world of creatures to populate paradise. I was brought up with working artists, and most of their friends, in fact, were working artists, so I was used to that. But um, every night I would go to sleep to the sound of the typewriter. Still now, the sound of somebody bashing away on a typewriter and the rain on the roof is something that makes me feel terribly secure. Um, because that was the time when he had to write. And when he hands me easily the key of entry, my joy must be dissembled under a shutter of horn, a dark lantern, in case it should too brightly burn. Because the journey has begun into the land where the sun is silent, and no one may enter the treehouse that hides the bones of a child in the forest of a man. There was a point there when, in, in the later years in Jerusalem, where he actually tried to stop writing, and he couldn't. He could not stop writing. I mean, it welled up in him like a sort of mountain spring. He, he had this almost pressure of creativity coming through him. I've seen it in several other artists too. It makes for a very selfish person, because to do the work, rather strongly on what you're doing and that does shut other people out sometimes. I guess I was brought up when I saw or felt that he was working, you didn't intrude. When I spent my life worrying, I also spent it drinking grog to alleviate the anxiety. In the long run, all I did was make a hole in my head. Once we moved into town, we shared an old large house in Karori and uh, he got a job as a postie and he went to training college. There was nothing untoward about it really, I mean posties had a drink afterwards when they finished the run, you know, and uh, well we know about students don't we, and training college students and um, met other young people, men and women who were writing and trying to get stuff published. All hard up, young marrieds with children, you know, having to do what they really wanted to do in their spare time. So uh, it was a pretty lively scene. He was sort of an intemperate postman when I knew him, just delivering mail around one in it. And he was just another one of the guys from, from down south who turned up part of the Wellington group of people called the Wellington Poets, they called them, that used to meet in the Grand Hotel and have a beer. I recall coming down from the tourist once and saying, hurry up, we were going to the Hotel St George, and I turned around and he was looking at a plane up in the sky, it was a jet plane, and I thought, oh, well, he's gravid with poem, he's poeming again, so I went on down to the bar, and sure enough, when he got down there, he got hold of a sort of a powered bill envelope and was screwed away, people used to just let him do it. The next thing, there it is in the listener, to a jet pilot, you see. To have a location as a writer is like holding to the stirrup iron of a swift and lively horse. One may be pulled through the brambles and across stones to the onlooker the choice will appear dangerous or even utter folly. But the horse was bred in heavenly stables and the vocation is a true one. I just think in terms of him being an alcoholic because I mean I didn't really quite know what an alcoholic was. I know he told me on one occasion that he woke up and he didn't know where he was. And then I think on another occasion when he found that he was swimming to Cupperty, he didn't know how he got there. And I think he then realised that, you know, things had sort of got out of hand a bit. When I first knelt down in a Catholic church, in half darkness before the flickering tabernacle light, and allowed myself to sink silently into the great ocean of that presence mysteriously contained in the consecrated host. The change was as if I had crossed a boundary from one country to another. I'll go back to 
the year in Christchurch, the year we became engaged, right? Uh, Jim became an Anglican. So I married an Anglican. His two children were actually um, christened in the Anglican church. But he's always a high Anglican. And um, one of his major preoccupations all the way through was religion. And he came home one day and he said that he had become a Catholic. And I found this difficult to take. Not that I had anything against Catholicism, but that I suddenly realized that this hadn't happened overnight, that this had been going on for some time. And I felt angry, I felt hurt, I felt shocked that, you know, that I could live with someone um, and have no idea that that was happening. And I asked him to go, okay? And so he did. What I remember is the sound of my father's footsteps going down the front steps, which were wooden, thonk, 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 and then I didn't see him again for another two years. It was extremely traumatic. It was horrible. That was the first separation. Um, my parents loved each other with a deep passion. And had a pretty tempestuous relationship. It really wasn't what we both wanted, you see. It was just that there was some, this, this major thing which it, I felt had come between us. And uh, he came to me and he said, look, I've been offered a chance to go to India and do a job for UNESCO and I want you to come with me. So I knew immediately what I wanted to do, you know. And I said, yes, and he said, right, okay. Accordion and sweet, brisk drum waken a lounging passion outside the wooden tea shop where a young, black-trousered, androgynous dancer trounces the dust, crooking a mago's finger while pockmarked queers applaud and smoke. Great hawks like monoplanes above the bony tamarind, above the quarried rocks sail high, high, and Shiva, like a business uncle, watches the village girls with cans to fill file through the temple to a covered cistern. I remember he came back from town. It was very early. It must have been within the first few days. And he came back. He looked shocked. He was exhausted, he was pale, he was agitated, and he walked in and he stood sort of in front of me and he said, for me, he said, he said, now I know what life's been like for you. And I said, what on earth are you talking about? He said, I now know what it feels like to belong to a minority group. So that was lesson number one for Jim. <laughs> you come without procession dark spirit sought and found breeze tongue and cloud for whom my barefoot heart hiding in the mountains of transgression thirsts and waits a royal one more than brahma light beyond the sun he would travel third class and i don't know if you know what third class in india is like you know in a room taken for the night sluicing the chest and thighs dressed in loose pajamas lying insomniac under the giant fan. I knew the undesired accomplice, some sky or water demon, twisting the locks of the mind. He would come back a physical wreck. He actually had amoebic dysentery before he got to India. He had it all the way through, okay? And he wouldn't eat enough. Even I remember when he came back from Calcutta, he couldn't bear it, he'd just given everything away, right? Somewhere in his writing, I've now just forgotten what the reference was, he stopped to help a beggar. I threw some coins into his tin dish. The policeman, built like a Maori, guarding the fruit stalls in his khaki shorts, said, they're no use to him. But the man was not quite dead. When he was younger, he should have had a gun. 
here or in Karori. The sickness is not to be wanted. It changed, Jim. The road from India led to Jerusalem. That plus the, plus the, the shock of being a member of an ethnic minority group. What he was trying to do later in Jerusalem was to, he was still actually caring for that kind of person, you know? Outcasts, not just dropouts, because that's voluntary, but outcasts as well. People that you didn't want to know anymore. The poor implore a Marxist cage. Dragon seed, the huddled bundles lying in doorways have perhaps one chili, a handful of ground maize. King famine rules. In India, he came to, um, I don't want to sound fancy, he learned to honour the poor. I learned to in a, quite a different way. They had dignity and, uh, well, they knew what was what, they knew what life was worth. And he, he learned to honour the poor, you know, respect them, honour the poor. Post office, a grocer's store, a petrol station and a war memorial are strange places to sleep in if you stretch out on a bench in your oil skin before the dawn shows itself above the scrub hills like a terrible unhealed wound. Nowhere have I felt more strongly the atmosphere of the graveyard. The dead move in their concrete cabins. They want us to weep a little, to let them know that we know they have died. You sort of saw everything with new eyes, you know. The things that you'd sort of, you know, you were, you were used to letting things slide, you'd sort of turn a blind eye. You know. If it was something that you didn't really believe in, well, you sort of didn't say anything, you know. And uh, I found it hard, he found it much harder. And of course, being, you know, uh, in a public service job, and, and in effect, he was a bureaucrat, and he didn't like it. 22nd of October, 1959. Dear Noel, many things have happened over the past 10 years. One crawls or jumps through the usual hoops and finds oneself some fine day standing on a rather bare patch of ground, wondering what it was all about. Married, two kids, a girl of 10 and a boy of seven a job editing primary school bulletins. Like salamanders, we don't realise the element we live in. Us bureaucrats, I mean. A tight cramp like the impulse to masturbate squeezes me as I tilt back on the chair of bent tubes and rubber between the loaded desk and the door shut by a forgotten choice. It is not new, this nausea, a flicker of cold fire. My wife's photograph with canoes in her eyes and a steel crucifix pinned on the wall shattered the reflex that yielded for an instant to the invisible flame of nothingness. Caesar is not. I am. Fifty years ago, they hung my father up to a post by the wrists at Mud Farm in the middle of winter because he would not put a bullet through a fellow worker. Twenty years ago, they put my brother behind barbed wire to be eaten alive for five years by the devil of boredom. Now the smoke of burning bodies comes over the sea from Vietnam. The cops and the bureaucrats are at their butchering again. I have only one son. I'm afraid what they'll do to him. Very late at night, my son's red monkey crouches on the bookshelf, ready to beat a tom-tom automatically if you squeeze the bulb. It is a relevant emblem. Operation Phoebus equally rubs out stupidities and honourable speeches. There will come from radio dials a speechless hum, the rubber monkey waxes drum, and mushrooms grow above the cities, cruelly dissolving in their furnace the pounds of youth and age, the flask of pities. Said Uncle Sam to Harry Fat, your folks are fine to know, and it's great the way your island keeps afloat there down below. But you need the global attitude to produce a first-class show. Just give me time, said Harry Fat, and the tourist trade will grow. It's not my place, said Uncle Sam, to give advice to you. But you don't know how to break a strike of monkeys in a zoo. 
Our company policemen could teach yours a thing or two. I'll change the law, said Harry Fat. It's an easy thing to do. I was tired of pounding the Wellington streets on a postman's round. 39 was a stopping place, and I applied for the Burns Fellowship. We ride south on a Wednesday into the clearer weather. Fetuses in the dead belly of the Thunderbird. Down to the city of our youth, my wife and I. It's a quiet place, but the pattern shifts a little. Those houses on Lookout Point, skull gray as something painted by Utrillo, ambiguously glitter. And I remember how in these parts the dead sleep under rough clay who will rise up in rage and hope at the judgment day, denying the quiet town, the quiet clouds, their hard, sod-cutting hands so like our own, bent in the cramp of lifelong separate pain. I'm not sure that he made the right decision, really. I'm not sure that he did. Because what happened when you became the Burns Fellow and suddenly he was a full-time writer and he had his own office and he had someone who could do, you know, copying for him and all the rest of it. He had every, all, the, all the apparatus. Drink fresh percolated coffee, lounging in the new house at the flash red kitchen table. A varsity person with an office just round the corner. What nonsense. My son sleeps above. My wife is sleeping also. My son's room smells of the incense that he burns before the Buddha, as good a way as any of yoking the demons that rise at puberty. Not demons, other selves. At 4 a.m., I still sit awake at the kitchen table like a Martian in a spacesuit, drinking coffee and writing. In 40 years, I haven't found a cure for being human. I've often thought if I ever wrote my memoirs, I would, the title would be In My Father's Shadow. It was very hard growing up as the son of James K. Baxter. I remember one hideous occasion when I was about 14, 15, being at a book launching in Dunedin at Otago University Press, John Griffin, um, and a beautiful young woman came up and said, hello. And my father came over and said, oh, this is my son, seed of my loins. And by the way, he's remarkably well hung. Of course, I retired into the background and blushing beetroot red. I mean, it was terrifying. If a big-eyed nymph occasionally visited me in my concrete burrow, hoping for an alleviation of the varsity horrors, well, all that happened was that I bored her with theological information and fatherly advice and sent her away with a pat on the rump to be seduced by somebody else in a mixed flat that I would most carefully avoid entering. He worked like you wouldn't believe. His output was absolutely amazing. I mean, it was almost terrifying. And now I was used to it, but I got worried. I thought, good grief, he can't possibly keep this up. You know, there was everything, and because, partly because he was well known down there, you know, it was his hometown, and everything was on go the whole time. And he'd go to a lecture, well, right, okay, most people, they'd go to a lecture, they'd come home and they, you know, and have a quiet cup of tea and go to bed. No, he'd come home with a whole retinue behind him. People were inviting him to come and lecture to the students. They knew damn well that they would pack the hall if they had James Cain Baxter coming. And he would look and he would sigh and say, I've got to go off and play James Q. Oxter. I have to go and put that mantle on. There were some interesting events. There was the time I climbed from my insomniac bed at 2 a.m. and drove in the pouring rain first to a hash shop where the company of the drunken destitute soothed me. Then 20 miles further out through the howling night to Tyree Mouth where I sat in my car and smoked and listened to the long, wild, mad black surf grinding in the beaches and communicated with the dead who had frequently lived in despair. The boys climbed to their branch. 
The noon cloud like a bird's breast downy, night come cool as a hawthorn berry, kite tails tied on a telephone wire. Never no more, never no more. Cigarette stink from a hole in the rushes, dark as a dunny, the underrunner. The green flax planted for whip lashes, cockabully thinned with the fire of summer. Jack loves what? Jill on the garage door. Never no more, never no more. The trodden path and the brambles led, sweet and sure to a lifted frock to the boathouse spree and the hayloft bed. A hamstrung heart and no way back. Like a toy toy arrow shot in the air. Never no more, never no more. Teeth the fellowship for a second year and the thought stuck with me. Okay, mate, but what'll you do when you have to get out of this old man's home, get off the bone of your ass and contend directly with whatever wad of rubbish society can deposit on your doorstep? The problem was security. Booze and women kill their quota, but the victims of imaginary security through money can be numbered in millions. And I could feel the death trance beginning. I think he burnt himself out, actually. It's the truth of the matter. Dear Sam, I thank you for your letter and for your poem too much better to look at than the dreary words I day by day excrete like turds to help the Catholic bourgeoisie to bear their own insanity. So if at Bottle Creek you should find a wetter in your shoe, ugly, hard-shelled with snapping jaws, a Hitler who has lost his cause, don't hit it with a shovel, no, christen it, Jim, and let it go. He was talking then of leaving, of giving up and of heading, and he described himself as, uh, as directed by spiritual radar. I remember him using that term. When I woke in the morning, the first thought in my mind was Jerusalem, meaning not the city in Palestine, but the mission station on the Wanganui River. And either immediately or very shortly after, a linked thought came into consciousness, that I should go to Jerusalem without money or books, there learn the spoken Maori from a man whom God would provide for me. where the people, both Māori and Pākehā, would try to live without money or books, worship God and work on the land. Recently, I had the privilege of attending a Māori tangi, a gathering where the friends and relatives of a man who had died came together to farewell him and to share their grief and hope and love. I joined Māori Pōnaki, became involved with the Māori Women's Welfare League and was later, I was a, um, on the selection committee of the Māori Education Foundation from the, uh, oh, for about 10 years I suppose it would have been. I didn't actually give it up until I went down with Jim to Dunedin and became a Burns Fellow. And uh, even then, for the first two years down there, I was still on the selection committee. So willy-nilly, Jim was drawn into my Māori activities. You had tied green leaves around your head. I laced a green branch in my lapel. On the concrete path to the meeting house, it was the women who cried out, calling and replying, the voice of those who have accepted death. And inside the door, a thing unacceptable to the world we inhabit, in which no one is allowed to speak of death, the dead man was conqueror. I saw him lying in the open boat of his own coffin, with shut eyes, winged moustache. Though his widow was weeping, he was not. And I knew for the first time the meaning of the yellow woven tukutuku panels, the shark's tooth, the flounder, the tears of the albatross. Understandable only when death is accepted as the center of life. The opening of a million to be participant. I washed and on the other. I mean, he was actually very Scottish. His father was a McCall Baxter. His mother was a Macmillan, both from the Western Highlands, both driven out in the Highland clearances. And my mother is from Taranaki. Well, 
If you don't know about the history of Taranaki in this country, it's time you learned. I saw the Maori Jesus walking on Wellington Harbour. He wore blue dungarees. His beard and hair were long. His breath smelt of mussels and para'oa. When he smiled, it looked like the dawn. When he broke wind, the little fishes trembled. When he frowned, the ground shook. When he laughed, everybody got drunk. The Maori Jesus came on shore and picked out his 12 disciples. One cleaned the toilets in the railway station. His hands were scrubbed red to get the shit out of the pores. One was a call girl who turned it up for nothing. One was a housewife who'd forgotten the pill and stuck her TV set in the rubbish can. One was a little office clerk who tried to set fire to the government buildings. Yes, and there were several others. One was an old sad queen. One was an alcoholic priest going slowly mad in a respectable parish. The Maori Jesus said, man from now on the sun will shine. He did no miracles. He played the guitar sitting on the ground. The first day he was arrested for having no lawful means of support. The second day he was beaten up by the cops for telling a D his house was not in order. The third day he was charged with being a Maori and given a month in Mount Crawford. The fourth day he was sent to Porarua for telling a screw the sun would stop rising. The fifth day lasted seven years while he worked in the asylum laundry, never out of the steam. The sixth day he told the head doctor, I am the light in the void, I am who I am. The seventh day he was lobotomized, the brain of God was cut in half. On the eighth day, the sun did not sat on the earth from then till now. Why do I go barefoot? Why do I have long hair and a beard? Why do I wear old clothes until they become unwearable? Every time I meet people in the towns, they ask me these things. It is not enough to say appearances don't matter. Poverty is the actual answer. All men are acquired by God to have a spirit of poverty. He was a man who walked out and left everything behind him. And like overnight or within a few days or weeks, um, became like a beggar. So we get back to beggars again. But in the meantime, um, you see all his clothes were still hanging in the wardrobe and uh, his cufflinks from the drawer, his tuxedo was in the cupboard. And I was, what I'm trying to say is I, I found it difficult to actually, uh, well, to believe in the beggar, right? And uh, I'm not saying it was a pose, but there were times when I, I, I wondered, I thought, no, uh, is this necessary? He could, I felt he could have done what he was trying to do without all of that, okay? He could have just gone in his ordinary clothes, you know, taken his shoes with him. <laughs> the tranquilizers on my glass-topped table, black and green pomegranate seeds, belong to Pluto, that rough king. So I have eaten six to go in quietly, quietly through the... I got her to mount again. They don't know I'm Pluto's queen. Oh, yes. I kept your letter saying it was no good. What did you mean by that? The drugged clouds race over the gun pit facing all storm, where you stopped the car and undid my jersey. Now my husband is undressing and jerking at his collar with the Bugs Bunny grin. I hate it so. I was uh, walking down Queen Street one day and into Vulcan Lane and saw this group of people, shabbily dressed um, people and uh, interesting looking people, I thought, because in those days I was still gloves and handbags and hats and things, you know, very proper. And, um, yeah, and, and met Hemi in the middle of all of this, who, who put his arms around her, which I thought was an, uh, an astounding thing for a stranger to do to another person. and, and uh, 
and uh, looked me in the eye and said, why don't you come down, sister? And it just sort of all just happened like that. It was like madness. I said craziness. It just happened. And I, I knew I had to go. No way did he ever set himself up to be a guru. He did, on the other hand, project a certain image. And that was deliberately done. The long hair, the beard, the bare feet, you know. In those days, the way you looked was very important. Short back and sides in a suit was establishment, and he wanted to make it very clear that he did not subscribe to that. And that was part of his image. Other people found him amazing. Somebody that's human, somebody that's actually... And met Hemi in the middle of all of this, who, who put his arms around her, which I thought was an, an astounding thing for a stranger to do to another person, and and, uh, and uh, looked me in the eye and said, why don't you come down, sister? And it just sort of all just happened like that. It was like madness. Absolute craziness. It just happened. And I, I knew I had to go. No way did he ever set himself up to be a guru. He did, on the other hand, project a certain image and that was deliberately done. The long hair, the beard, the bare feet, you know. In those days, the way you looked was very important. Short back and sides in a suit was establishment, and he wanted to make it very clear that he did not subscribe to that. And that was part of his image. Other people found him amazing. Somebody that's human, somebody that's actually making sense, somebody that's sane, somebody that's saying it's all right to be who you are. The material things don't matter. What matters is whether or not we care. We get hot water from the cylinder in the bathroom, and the water itself comes from a spring a quarter of a mile up the road. We have clothes to wear. The roof keeps the rain out. There is an electric stove to cook on. Food, clothing, dry shelter. What more does anybody need? Sometimes I worry about money, but so far, God has always paid our bills. At my back door, and when I meditate in the paddock under the apple tree, two healthy dung-smeared pigs strike up a conversation, imagining, I think, I am their benefactor. That should be quite enough to keep the bowels moving and the mind thankful. Yet when the sun rises, my delusion hears them shout above the river fog. This is the hill fort of our God. It's called Hiru Harima. The goat and the opossum will find a home among the rocks and the river of joy will flow from it. He really was trying to live the idea of, well, in a certain sense, death as a model for life. Um, I suppose that, you know, when we die, we, we literally do leave everything. <laughs> and, uh, and it gives us a freedom, and certainly in the Christian sense, it gives us that final freedom. You know, like Jesus on the, on the cross, you know, the victory of death. Last time I'd saw, seen him before he died was three months before he died. And we'd actually had a huge argument. Um, he had lost his faith. I was used to him always having a strong sense of purpose and a raison d'etre, a reason to be, you know, a... a, 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 a a direction and it was as if he'd lost it and I got angry with him. He was turning towards charismatic Christianity which I didn't have very much um, time for. And then later of course when we got to, into uh, well you know sort of straight out punishing himself. I mean why was he doing that? What I would have liked to have said to him and never got the chance to say is, hey, look, you know, you're a wonderful man. Have some faith in yourself. You don't need to be searching for anything else. You know more than most people I've ever met what this life is about. There was a man who lived at Jerusalem. He had an old coat. He wore his toenails long. The newspapers made up stories about him to entertain the housewives. Why couldn't he live in the kingdom of anxiety like any other man and go into his house like a rabbit to its burrow? 
God was his problem. God and the universe. He had, let us say, a problem of identity. Now, if you go to the Valley of Jerusalem, you'll find that the silence is like any other silence. You'll find that the river is like any other river. You'll find that the rain is like any other rain. But the old man has gone out of the picture, leaving an empty picture frame. Up here at the Farapuni, that star at the kitchen window mentions your name to me. Clear and bright like running water, it glitters above the rim of the rain. Jerusalem, woman, it is my wish our bodies should be buried in the same grave. I have seen at evening two ducks fly down to a pond together. The whirring of their wings reminded me of you. Those we knew when we were young, none of them have stayed together. All their marriages battered down like trees by the winds of a terrible century. I was a gloomy drunk, you were a troubled woman. Nobody would have given tuppence for our chances. Yet our love did not turn to hate. If you could fly this way, my bird, one day before we both die, I think you might find a branch to rest on. I chose to live in a different way. Today I cut the grass from the paths with a new sickle, working till my hands were blistered. I never wanted another wife. people, Marion Parker, huh? all so very, very moved. Uh, I mean, they moved me physically so that I was inclined to cry, which I never am as a rule, just because of the, of the weeping going on all around me. It was particularly trying for Jackie, his widow, because she sat beside the open coffin for hours and hours and hours, and it was embraced all the time. Must have been dreadful. At that time, you see, his Maori friends were in one part, and the, the hippies were another. Uh, the junkies and a lot of the literati stood outside the gates and didn't come in. They sort of separated out into groups, parts of Baxter's life. As we were taking him up the hill, with a slight rise, the coffin seemed to get a lot heavier. There was Jim's brother, there was John, there was Greg Wakataka, and uh, he was talking to Jim as we went up, and he said, oh, what's the matter, Jim? Don't you want to go? Look, we're nearly there. And he was talking in this way, and we all sort of laughed. People may not remember who was Prime Minister in 1975 in this country in a hundred years' time, but I do think that people will still possibly be reading Baxter's poetry then. Now, he made a contribution to the culture of this country that can't be denied. And whatever sacrifices we had to make as his family, I think were probably really worth it. Yeah. Now, looking back past it, you know, right over me with your bloody great big boots on and your Nga Mokai. In the meantime, you've ditched your own family, you know. That's how it felt at the time, but now looking back at it, I see what he was doing. Yeah. I think I've grown big enough to understand. I may not like it. The repercussions in my life may not be pleasant, but I do understand, yeah. One tooth is left only at the back of my bottom jaw. There's kapok in my beard. My guts are shrunk with fasting among the tamatoa. I don't get sleep. This body falls to bits, like a mattress that gapes open. It would be nothing, man, if the soul burns softly like a candle that's lit in a windowless fare to give us good dreams. But if I come to God, it will be by a road where there's not even starlight, only the voice of rivers, Rakaya, Rangitata, Oha, Plutha. And now the Wanganui who washes my body before its burial will say, Na karakia mohime te tutua. Many, young and old, have had a look at the Medusa's head which present-day urban civilization turns towards them. Depersonalization, centralization, desacralization, 
Some are turned to stone by it. What looks like complacency in them is instead a trance of fear. Where does one's hope lie? Not, I think, in the mental or material engines of technology. My own hope lies in the hearts of people. <laughs>